Well, you've got some unique insight here based on your past experience. Um, and I suppose the first question would be, with the, with the new, with the 47, with the new Trump administration, uh, what would you assess to be the key changes in U.S. policy in the Middle East? Well, I think it's a complete reset uh, when you think about where we were at the end of 2020, where we've been for the last four years and where we will go back to. It's a pendulum swing. Uh, we had maximum pressure uh, in place on Iran at the end of 2020. The regime was down to $4 billion in accessible foreign exchange reserves. Qasem Soleimani, the, their terror chief, was dead. Uh, they had halted major escalation in the nuclear arena because they were afraid uh, that Trump might attack uh, inside Iran against the uh, nuclear sites. Uh, and then we went into four years of a very different policy, sort of racing after the Iranians, trying to go back to the 2015 Iran nuclear deal, trying to negotiate a worse deal than that, that the Iranians uh, were uh, extorting the Biden administration for, weakening our sanctions, loosening them, not enforcing them. And then, of course, pressure on Israel at various points, uh, most notably in the last several months, since the beginning of the year, post October 7th. And so when you have a recipe of uh, pressure on Israel, uh, concessions, deference, appeasement, whatever you want to say, accommodation as policies towards Iran, the region is going to look very much like the region looks like today. And that is multi fronts on fire and a lot of conflict uh, and an inability to move forward in peace expansion and Arab Israeli integration. So I think the most important thing for a new Trump administration to do is take stock of where we are. What are the challenges in front of us, but also what are the opportunities? Challenges, you know, include Iran racing forward over the last four years in the nuclear domain, really sitting forth in inches from the nuclear threshold, not just on the production of the nuclear material, but also potentially doing things in the weaponization front as well, as we understand from some of the leaked uh, reports over the last few months. We obviously have a multi-front conflict that's erupted after October 7th. Uh, but at the same time, uh, some opportunities. Uh, the Israelis have done an enormous amount of damage to Hezbollah. The Israelis have now taken out the strategic air defense of Iran. Uh, you still have the Houthis there raining down missiles and drones into the Red Sea, denying international shipping in one of the most important waterways. China is watching that very closely to see what Donald Trump mm -hmm. will do to reopen maritime traffic uh, and, and change the policy there. So uh, there's uh, challenges, there's opportunities. Uh, if you reconstitute a pressure campaign, if you bring the Saudis, the Emiratis, the Bahrainis back into our orbit, away from China's orbit, recommit uh, uh, as their security partner for the century, uh, bring Israel close in uh, instead of showing distance or putting pressure on the Israelis, uh, I think you open up a lot of diplomatic space and you're going to start seeing those actors just with Donald Trump coming back into office and their fear of what he might do. You know, he I've always said this during the campaign. He's himself personal deterrence. Um, he is, you know, because of his unpredictability, um, the fact that he has at times you know, been transactional, at times been confrontational. He's shown a willingness to use force when necessary, but he's open to diplomacy. Uh, he has adversaries always on a back foot uh, by design, and that's going to have immediate impact. If you're thinking about his statements at the RNC earlier in the summer of, we better have hostages back home by the time I take office. Well, who's thinking about that right now? Probably the Qataris in Doha who continue to sponsor and host Hamas and have a lot of influence there. Maybe the Turks, Erdogan, who has a lot of sponsorship and influence over Hamas, maybe in Beirut and in Cairo. So I think the region is itself uh, sort of stepping back and saying, OK, what does this mean? And if we're able to bring our partners closer, re-identify adversaries as adversaries, Oh, and by the way, another big opportunity, the domestic energy policy is going to change, which will be an incredible signal to the market alongside closer partnerships with the Saudis to give us more flexibility in cracking down on the oil sales to China that Iran has skyrocketed, uh, you know, potentially open up opportunities uh, for partners uh, to uh, be a little bit more uh, risk taking instead of risk averse, knowing that the uh, oil markets will be flexible. Uh, and uh, be able to uh, uh, take uh, instability or, or short-term things that can produce long-term stability, I should say. Uh, I think that opens up a large option menu, and our adversaries have to see that option menu and be scared about it. Therefore, I do think you start seeing a restoration of deterrence. I think you see stability coming back. You actually start having parties that have refused to deal with the Israelis on ceasefire negotiations, 
on good terms for Israel coming back to the table. Maybe that happens in Lebanon. Maybe that happens in Gaza. Uh, and I think you finally see, you know, this idea of peace through strength being restored. Yeah, uh, I mean, if you if you look at the Iranian regime, it's it, it, it's hard to really process their level of belligerence, right? I mean, I think it's right in the aftermath, the immediate aftermath, I suppose we're still there, of the election in the U.S., there were a number of people coming out and saying, well, the, the, the Iranian regime must be panicking, right? Um, and uh, there was talk about how, well, maybe they're going to rethink their idea of a retaliatory strike, which the Supreme Leader had called for on Israel. But then within a day and a half on one of the IRGC's Telegram channels, they referenced the assassination attempts against President, uh, or President, former President Trump with a comment to the effect of, we're going to finish the job. So I suppose, I'm not sure if I have a question there or I'm just looking for more of your assessment. I don't see how you resolve anything uh, in the region in terms of creating long-term stability, which would create long-term prosperity for a lot of people, including the Palestinians, Lebanese, uh, the Saudis, Jordanians, they're clearly on board with the idea of let's, let's move forward here away from these sort of conflicts. But I don't see how you get there with the existing Iranian regime and IRGC, unless they fundamentally change their belief system, which I don't see happening, you know, how do you, how do you approach this? Putting, getting ceasefires in, in the various locations where you've got conflicts is really just sticking a Band-Aid on a sucking chest wound, it seems. Uh, that's correct. I mean, ultimately, the source of all of these conflicts and fronts is Iran. Um, and so if you are able to squeeze the regime and resources, deny them of oxygen financially, militarily, strategically, you're also uh, starving the oxygen from the tentacles of that octopus on all those fronts, uh, which is why I think that the more pressure that goes on to Iran, those fronts become more malleable. Uh, but uh, to your point, um, there is one threat, obviously, that they use more than any other to uh, squeeze us, uh, to you know, use psychological operations, information operate, influence campaigns, whatever you want to characterize it as, uh, to extort us into not squeezing them. And that is, of course, the nuclear threat. Uh, if they sit there on the one yard line and we sit here and fear that they might move forward, they might go to breakout. Uh, and we also uh, demonstrate some sort of fear of the use of military uh, force or, or constraint on Israeli use of military force to deny them that breakout, then they know they have us over a barrel. Uh, and then they're able to do all the things that they do outside of the nuclear domain, which keep us hampered, uh, pinned down in the Middle East and unable to actually have a force posture of what the world should reflect given the threats we face uh, over the next few years in the Indo-Pacific. So. My thesis is you need to remove that existential threat, that existential danger, their largest card to play, deny them the nuclear extortion piece. When that piece is removed, there is nothing to stop you from squeezing the regime of resources for all of these malign activities. And the second piece of this, of course, is we can't just continue to have a continuous zone defense in the Red Sea against the Houthis. Uh, you just cannot have this uh, uh, level of naval and air force commitment over many, many months when we need to be surging potentially in the Indo-Pacific, we might see an uptick in harassment of the Philippines from where it already is now. We might see greater saber rattling and moves towards Taiwan. We have to be nimble and be ready to flex and surge into the Indo-Pacific. Uh, therefore, the current force posture is unsustainable. The answer is not to cut a bad deal and have another JCPOA and appease the regime to try to pivot. The answer is to remove the existential dangers and restore deterrence. And I think that's what Donald Trump will do.